Welcome to Night Talks, the University of Florida College of Journalism and Communications talk show produced by students for students. I'm MJ Holloway, a senior studying media production, and our guest today is the sensational coach Mike Holloway, head coach of the University of Florida men's and women's track and field and cross country programs. Oh, and by the way, he so happens to also be my dad. Hi, Coach Holloway. Thank you for being here today. Good morning. You're very welcome. Sir, we're still celebrating Florida's recent 2023 NCAA outdoor <clears throat> title. Go Gators. Recap how Florida took the championship and all the students and staff that earned this win. The biggest thing with this this championship was um, it's kind of unexpected by others, not unexpected by us. Um, everybody really bought in and really trusted and believed the process. You know, you've heard me talk about that a lot throughout your life, right? <laughs> and I think the biggest thing was is that you know we just wanted a chance, and uh, we talked about it, you know, coming down to the four by four, and it did, and you know, we we happened to we were blessed enough to have the best four by four on the track. Um, uh, you know, I'm the face of the program, but I can't do this without the sensational staff that I have and uh, the student athletes. And it's just a total buy-in by everybody involved. And we, we scored in a, in a lot of events. Uh, we, we, were, we were second in the four by one. PJ Austin was fifth in the hundred. We went, uh, Emmanuel Bamadelli won the 400. Ryan Woolley was second. Javon Powell was seventh. Robert Gregory was fourth in the 200. We won the four by four. Uh, Malcolm Clemens was fourth in the tri uh, long jump, and Sean Dixon Bodie was fourth in the triple jump. And those were our scores. And we we scored 57 points to win the meet by four points over Arkansas, who had 53. Congratulations again. Thank you. This is your 13th national title in 20 seasons between the two programs. What are the keys to a championship culture that finds this level of success? Well, you know, I think it starts with recruiting. Uh, we have to have the the right athletes, and then there has to be a buy-in when the athletes get here. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I have a sensational staff, and that requires a buy-in by them. Uh, I, I'm a little different. Uh, I expect a little different of myself, and I expect a little different of my staff. And so it requires everybody to be on the same page in the same book. So there are times when everybody doesn't agree, but when we come together and I say, well, this is how we're going to do it, when we walk out of the room, everybody's on the same page and, and believes in what we're doing, and, and that's why it works. So and there's been a couple times where the team might not be on top of the world at the indoor national championships or even the SEC meets. How do you turn that around and make your program so successful at the national meet? Well, I think you know the, the, the first thing is is that I don't blame the athletes. You know, it's, I'm the coach, so if something goes wrong at the, the, the competition, then the first person I have to look at is myself. And so if something goes wrong, I go back, I figure out what it is, I go to the staff, and then we take whatever changes we're going to make to the athletes, and we, we roll from there. Plus, by that time of year, especially when we're outdoors, the landscape's kind of been set, so we know what we have to do, and now it's just a matter of getting ready to do it. In high school, you ran track yourself, um, oh, and you also won a state. You, it was a long time ago, but you also <laughs> won a state uh, cha state championship. Who introduced you to the sport, and what goals did you have for yourself? My aunt Liz, uh, my mother's uh, baby sister, saw me racing my friends in the neighborhood, and she thought I'd like track and field. So she said, "Hey, let's go to let's go to a track meet." Ironically, the first thing I saw when I walked into the meet was this guy pole vaulting. So he comes down the runway and he, and he you know, sticks the pole in the ground, he vaults in the air and he comes down the, on the bar between his legs, right? I'm like, I don't want to do track and field, right? you know? And, uh, but she's like, no, that's not what it's about. And you know, I was hooked and I had no expectations. I had no idea where track would take me. I didn't know much about it. And as I got older and matured and became more successful in the sport, I really, I just grew to love it and it's just, it's what, I, it's what I do, yeah. Where did it all begin for you? When did you know that coaching was gonna be something of your passion? I have a very good friend of mine, uh, Ms. Terry Davis, and I was working at a place here in town called Taco Nacho, and uh, just, you know, just not doing much with my life. And she came to me and said she wanted, she was starting a, a youth track club, and she wanted me to coach the hurdles. And at first, I was like, oh, I don't have time. And then she was like, no, you're going to coach my hurdles. <laughs> <laughs> and so I go out, I start coaching the hurdles. And within three, four, five weeks, I was coaching the whole team. And it was just, 
man, it was just something that was invigorating. I, it was, I had this love and a passion for it, and I've never lost it. It was just amazing. And so I still have that same passion. And I've told you this before. If, if I ever wake up and that passion is gone, I'm going to turn my keys in. But so far, we're, we're hanging in there. So. Hanging in there, hanging in there. You became the assistant coach of the UF men's track and field team in 1995. While at the same time you were working on getting your bachelor's degree. What does the day-to-day of an assistant coach involve, and was it difficult managing academics as well? It was difficult at times, but it was, it was required. I, I was at the point in time in my life where I knew that, as I tell you guys, you know, if you hang your spikes up, you have to have something to fall back on. And I had violated that rule because I didn't have my degree at the time. And if I knew that if I wanted to be a successful person and have a successful life, that I needed to get my degree. And you know, you weren't born yet, but I mean, uh, your sister was here and I knew how to take better care of her. And so that was part of my process of bettering myself so I could make sure you guys had a good life. Your degree was in history. What drew you to that field of study? Your uncle Ed, my high school coach, history major. <laughs> makes sense. Uh, so it makes sense now, right? I mean, you know, that's, he's like my dad. You know, you, you know me, we, we have these conversations and I'm a kind of a history buff when it comes to a lot of things. And history is very interesting. It was just kind of something that captured my imagination. And when I'm doing papers or doing maps and stuff like that, you know, it was something that I could dive into. I didn't just want to get a degree to have a degree. I wanted to have a degree in something that had an interest for me. And so that's why I chose history. Was history always your passion major or did you switch it up? Um, you know, my initial thought when I was your age, I thought I was going to be a lawyer and, uh, that didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I actually was studying special education. And then it's just when I got the job here, I was at Buholz High School and I was working on a special education degree. And when I got here, the demands of that degree did not allow me to, you know, be assistant coach at the same time. I couldn't leave campus and go do an internship over at a high school, you know, for four hours a day. So that's why I changed to history. Um, being a history major, how does it translate to the track? I mean, the thing that I learned from, from, from history is one, history repeats itself and people don't understand that. And the other thing is too, if you go back and you're studying history and you, you delve into the, the wars that happened and the, the conflicts that happened, and in order to solve those conflicts, people had to sit down and come to an agreement. If you were a, a major or a general in a war, and you got whipped, you had to go back and figure out how to, to, to win the next war, right? So I've taken that kind of mindset with my track and field coaching. If we have a bad meet, if I come back and do the same things again, we'll have another bad meet. So when things go wrong, I come back and I, I fix them. You've heard me say, hey, I've got broad shoulders, that's my fault, I'll fix it. And so th I think history taught me that. Back in 2012, we had just won our third national title. And a friend of mine called me and he goes, oh, don't get used to this. It's cyclical, it's gonna go away. It doesn't have to go away. And so that was my thing is, you know, like I said, history repeats itself. And historically, when, when I'm done here at the University of Florida, I want that, that legacy to be that we were always, you know, prepared to do our best when it counted the most. In 2002, you became the head coach of the UF men's track and field team, later also becoming the head coach of the women's team in 2007. Do you see advantages to be a combined program? Oh, there's huge advantages to being combined. So if you're a single gender program, so you've got three coaches trying to coach 21 events for the women and three trying to coach 21 for the men. Well, if you bring everybody together, now you've got six to spread across all the event areas. And now everybody gets more attention. You don't have to be on the track as long. You still have to be out there all day, but not quite as long. And the biggest thing is, is that, you know, now you have six sets of eyes versus three. And again, like I talked about earlier, the key to that is everybody being on the same page. And so as long as we all have the same passion, the same drive, the same goals for what we want out of the program, that it works really well. So how does that translate to the student athlete experience? Every athlete gets personalized attention now. So I don't have a field event coach that's trying to coach the long jump, the triple jump, the high jump, the shot, but the discus, the pole vault, right? Yeah. So I've got a throws coach, I have a jumps coach, and now we have the ability to hire somebody to come in and help assist them in certain areas. You know, I have, I don't have one distance coach, we have two distance coaches now. So at the end of the day, it, it enhances the student athlete's experience because they get personalized attention and very close detail to what their events are. What are some highlights from your time leading these teams and working with these student athletes? I mean, the biggest highlight for me is just watching, you know, watching young folks get better. 
you know, having that aha moment, uh, whether it's a guy that, you know, comes here as a 21 footer and becomes a 51 foot triple jumper, you know, whether it's a guy that, you know, it's a walk on that ends up being an all American, you know, just watching those experiences, watching people figure it out. And, you know, as you know me, practice is the best time for me. Watching people work hard and figure things out during practice is, is you know, the best part of my day. So that's the biggest thing right there. Uh, you've always told me growing up that practice makes permanent, not perfect. Where did that come into play for you? And how does that, how do you translate into your everyday life? I'm not gonna act like I made that up. I'm sure I read that someplace. You know me, I read a lot, right? And I think the biggest thing for me with that is, is well, it's a true statement. When you hear that, you know, you think, wow, you know, that makes sense. You know, like you've heard me say, you walk the way you walk because you do it every day. You talk the way you talk because you do it every day. Now you can change that. It'll take time. But so again, it makes permanent. So when we're doing things in practice, we talk about the little things. And it's the little things that, as I tell you guys all the time, the little things win championships. It's the little things that you ingrain in your everyday practices that show up when, you, when it matters the most. What people don't understand is typically in high intensity situations, the mistakes you make in a, in a game or something when you're really hyped up are the same mistakes you make in practice when you're tired. So if you learn not to make the things, the, the mistakes in practice when you're tired, then you won't make them in a competition. That's good. I never thought about it like that. Why is UF a great place to call home? Why do athletes move halfway across the country to be a part of your track and field program? Well, I mean, you know, winning's contagious, right? <laughs> I think that's the biggest thing. I mean, nobody, you know, there's no great athletes aren't going to go come and be, be a part of a program that, where they're not winning. And then our academic record here is, is incredible. It's just the, the, the total student athlete experience at the University of Florida is incredible. We have great academics, we have great academic support. If you're a track and field athlete, I mean, our baseball team's pretty good, our basketball team, for football, you know, golf just won a national championship, you know, swimming's good. So it's just a total athlete experience where there's multiple sports that are good. So when you go sit down in the dining hall, it's just not like, okay, well, the track team is good and everybody else not very good. Every, everybody's good here. So that adds to the experience and we have a wonderful, you know, our, our, our athletic department, you know, with, with Scott Strickland and Linda Teeler and, and, and the folks over there um, are very supportive of what we do. We have a phenomenal strength um, program here with Matt Delancey and his crew. And his, as you know, you know, Lawrence and her crew in the, in the uh, downstairs in the training room. So the, the academic support, the athlete support, the whole experience with lots of teams being good here makes it hard for people to turn us down. As head coach, how do you think about uh, and interact with sports media. How do you advise athletes on the topic of interacting with media in terms of like social media and posting and stuff like that? Cautiously. <laughs> you know, uh, once you push the send button, even if you try to take it back, it's still out there someplace. And I don't think people understand that. And you know me well enough to know that one, we're gonna remain humble. You know, us, we're not the team that's bragging. We're not the team that's poking at other people. We're not the team that's out there trying to tell people how great we are. Our actions, our performances will tell us people, you know, that's all we need. And at the end of the day, my issue with social media is that I call it cyber courage. People say things in social media that they would never say to people face to face. What are some of the different challenges you've had to face in terms of interviewers, uh, reporters, you know, I mean, you just won a national title, so I'm sure you had a bunch of people trying to ask you a bunch of questions, so. Well, I think that probably lots of the media think I'm boring um, because they, they try to probe me to get me to predict things, try to probe me to get me to be, you know, like one guy said, hey, you can be arrogant now. No, I can't, that's not who I am. I'm not gonna be Pat Riley and guarantee we're gonna win again next year, right? I'm not gonna do that. Um, I'm not gonna be the guy that's, you know, standing up there pounding my chest, talking about how great we are. So when the media comes to me, I'm a very bland, very, you know, kind of even killed guy. And so the challenges with me is to, for them to understand that I'm not gonna be the bragging, I'm not gonna be arrogant, I'm not gonna be conceited. I'm not gonna put, I, I'm not the guy you get a lot of great quotes from probably. That's probably, they don't like me, but, uh, as long as they're respectful, I answer their questions. I don't turn any of the media away because I do think that we do need to make sure that the student athletes get celebrated here. You know, I'm the face of the program, so a lot of people talk to me, but I haven't crossed the finish line in a long time. And it will be a long time again before I do cross one, so they need to get their credit as well. Beals High School here in Gainesville recently named their track after you. What does that honor mean to you? It's just an incredible honor. and. When I first got the call months and months ago and they asked me, would I be okay with it? I'm like, yeah, why, why would I be okay with it? And as, we, as the time approached and the ceremony went on and 
you know, your mom and I went out there to the track that day and I saw all these people I hadn't seen in forever. It was just the best feeling. And then we're walking around the track and your mom goes, look. And I look up and I see my name. And that's when it hit me. I, like, I get the chills right now thinking about it. And it's a tribute to all the people that, again, my support system I had at Buell's High School, the principals, assistant principals, and teachers out there, the athletes that came out every day and worked hard to help us be successful at Buell's High School. It was the same thing. I didn't cross the finish line out there either. So, right. <laughs> yeah. So when you were at Beholds, you were coaching more cross country, um, as cross country and track as well. And I know cross country had a lot of success, but what's the difference between coaching high school athletes versus college athletes? Um, you know, well, first of all, I'll tell you, we had a lot of success in both. You know, we we won four state titles in both, so don't 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 put the track folks down. <laughs> now. But uh, but I, mean, I think the biggest difference in, with college is I I think the college is more difficult because see when you're in high school you go home. When you're in high school, you know, your parents are regulating, you know, with, when you eat and when you sleep and when you get up. When you come to college, nobody's regulating that. So in high school in, and in college, okay, I have you guys like two or three hours a day. That leaves 21 other hours, right? <laughs> so but when you were in high school, the 21 hours, you go home to your parents. When you're in college, I don't know what you guys are doing. So you know, a lot of prayer, you know, that you guys are listening to us and doing the right things and taking care of your bodies and eating well and all that stuff. But what it comes down to, I think, is, you know, there's an expectation here. You know, you guys all understand that, that, you know, we have a standard that we fight to every day. And because of that standard, I don't think any of you guys want to be one, the one that messes it up. Beyond working with just collegiate athletes, you also have a group of professional athletes that you coach as well. Um, talk about how it is managing so many different athletes on so many different schedules. Well, I think the biggest thing is uh, track and field is track and field. And I, and I tell people this all the time. So if you're a collegiate athlete, and we're trying to get to us to peak in May or June. If you're a, if you're a post collegiate athlete, then your peak's in July. So I just move everything back a month. It's not hard, it's not rocket science. It gets messed up when people want to tweak it. Oh, we gotta do this, we gotta do that. No, just do what you've been doing. Just take your program and move it back. So if, if I'm coaching you and we have a great year and I, and I got you ready to be at your absolute best in June and I need you to be best in August, so what should I change? Just move everything back two months and it worked, right? Can you talk about the difference in coaching, you know, professional athletes versus the other two? I think the biggest thing with the professional athlete is kind of the same difference. It's like, okay, so when you're the collegiate athlete, you have this incredible support system. You know, we talked about Coach Delancey, we talked about Yolanda, we talked about the nutrition and stuff that we have here. When you become a professional athlete, then you have to go out on your own and find those things sometimes. And you have to be even more diligent to your craft because you don't have the, the University of Florida support system behind you. And I think the biggest difference too is when you become a professional athlete, now that's your paycheck. You know, when you're at University of Florida, hey, you know that you're going to get get that stipend at twice a uh, semester, right? Then now, when you're a professional athlete, your performances dictates how well you eat or don't eat. So, right. In 2012 Olympics, you coached the Team USA sprinters and relay teams. Tell us about that experience and the role you played towards those athletes medaling. Um, I played no role whatsoever with those athletes medaling. It was an incredible experience. I saw some things I'd never seen before in my career. But I think people understand that as an Olympic coach, really, you just, unless you have athletes there yourself, and I was blessed to have, you know, some athletes there. Um, but unless you have athletes there yourself, you're just a glorified babysitter. You know, and, and it's amazing to me the people that think, oh, you know, so-and-so coached, you know, Tyson Gay. Tyson Gay has a coach. And so my job as the Olympic sprint coach in 2012 was to make sure the coaches had what they needed, to make sure they got, you know, all the stuff they needed for their athletes to be successful. That's your role as USA track and field coach. Fast forward to about 2020, you returned to the Olympics and you became the head coach of the men's track and field team. Was this Olympics any different considering everything that happened in terms of being on a different continent plus the pandemic or anything like that? Oh, it was very challenging. You know, getting up and getting tested every morning, getting up and uh, you know, riding on buses with people and you're not sure you know, if you're gonna <laughs> contract this you know, very, very serious disease that was going on. Um, I think the biggest thing was too, like going to the stadium and there's nobody in there. Right. It was just very, you know, the Olympics, I can remember, man, way back in 2000, going to the Olympic Games and going to a morning session in the stadium, was like 100,000 people there. You know, it's like, it was just amazing. So having, walking into a stadium and it's the people on the track and nobody else there was kind of, kind of different. But I think the biggest thing with that was, that will be the Olympics that I will remember the most because those group of athletes had to face a set of challenges that nobody will ever understand. You know, like we had a guy that was favored to win the pole vault who had isolated himself, you know, 
contract the disease. And then so he couldn't compete. And so he lost that opportunity and you can never get that back. How did you prepare those athletes for that? Knowing that there wasn't going to be any fans, knowing that they're going to have to get tested every day. How did you prepare your coaching staff and the support system and those athletes for that? No, what we talked about was just being you know, diligent but patient with people, understanding that people, everybody handled it differently, right? And so just because I thought it was okay to do something, if somebody said to me, hey, coach, I don't want to be with that, around that many people, I want to do this this way so that I'm more comfortable with it, then it was my job to make them feel comfortable. It wasn't my job to say, hey, everybody's going to do this exact same way. And that's just not the way the world works. And like I said, everybody handled it differently. You know, so we just had to let people be themselves, get into a comfort zone that allowed them to compete at a high level. That's good. The Olympic Games are the, the big show on the planet. With international athletes and round-the-clock broadcasts, were media obligations at that level more demanding? Um, typically, they could be, but because of the pandemic, they weren't. You know, that's and so it was. It wasn't as much. You know, we had a couple of Zoom calls, we had a couple of uh, you know phone things, but there wasn't any mass gatherings with the media during the, the Tokyo Olympics. Lastly, could you tell us whether life is a sprint or a marathon, and what advice would you give to us that helped you reach your goals? Um, one, life is absolutely a marathon that has a, a few sprints along the way. There are times in life where you have to you know, speed things up and you have to get things done. But most importantly, even during that sprint, you have to understand that I'm gonna have to slow down and let this process take place. I think that's the biggest mistake people make in life is that they wake up and they wanna be the best at something when they're not close to that yet. So do you have the patience to work diligently every day, take the steps to become a better person, to become a better athlete? And a lot of people don't wanna do that. A lot of people wanna just, walk in the door and be the world champion. It's just not that simple. You know, a lot of people want to, you know, we hear people talk all the time, well, I'm going to be a millionaire. You don't even have a job, right? So let's, let's get a job first, right? You know, so that kind of thing. So I think the biggest thing for me is that my patience and my ability to kind of forecast what the future could look like if we take certain steps helps me a lot. And the other thing is, is you know, I don't panic. I don't, I don't worry about things. You know, as your grandpa used to tell us, Pray about everything, worry about nothing, right? So that's who we are. And when, when you know, you're gonna have bumps in the road, instead of looking at that bump and, oh, you know, oh my God, the world's coming to an end, you got two choices. You can smooth it out, you can walk around it. But, you know, you can't just stop. All right. You, you're a 13 time national champion. If you could pick one moment, one race, one moment that was like, and you'll never forget. I know there's a, I'm sure there's a bunch of them, that one key moment that you were like, I really like I'm really happy for this athlete. I know this will never forget that. What would that moment be? Okay. Um, I'm gonna ask can I answer that from the personal side first, right? Okay. So like the two biggest moments in my life were being in the room when your sister was born and when you were born. Like nothing will ever trump that. Uh, when it comes to the athletic side, when our when in my first championship as a high school coach. You know, I can remember state championship and cross country and I thought we'd won, but everybody wanted to wait to the trophy ceremony. So they kept hiding the scores from me. Right. So uh, that was a great moment. And then, you know, uh, another great moment was when we won our first indoor championship. You know, you were a little guy. I don't know if you remember that it was back in 2004. So you were a really little guy and um, being able to celebrate that with you and your mom was was awesome. I'm actually, I know I've asked you this question at home a couple of times, but if you could build your all time Florida four by four. Why are we doing this? Who's on it? <laughs> um, can I plead the fifth on that one? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay, well, <clears throat> let's see. Ryan Willie, Champion Allison, you're not being fair. It's just two more. I mean, I guess you just got to go down the all time list and put, uh, well, there's no way Armand Hall's not on there, right? <laughs> there's no way Armand Hall doesn't make it. And we put Karan Clement, we put in Grant Holloway. Who we put on that last leg? Grant Holloway. Grant Holloway. Yeah. Is Grant that Holloway. is that in order? Is that the order you wanted? No, it? I have to think about the order. We have to get to the meet, see what's on the line, that oh, kind of thing. You know, just sort of decide the order. So, I have a question. What has been your biggest challenge, being my son growing up here in Gainesville? Um, I would say. My biggest challenge was not trying to put too much pressure on myself. You know, you talked about earlier that 
life is a marathon with a couple of sprints in it. And I was trying to sprint from the beginning, thinking I was going to make it all the way to the end. So I say my biggest challenge was realizing that I might not be the best athlete now, but I could be if I work hard. You know, you saw that a lot with me in high school basketball. You know, I was on JV my freshman year and I ended up being a starter my sophomore year. And as coach said, I was probably one of the best guards to come through his program. So just realizing that you have a lot of success and try to make my own story was probably my biggest, my biggest challenge. So besides the championships um, and everything else of that nature, what kind of legacy does Mike Holloway want to leave here at UF? I just want to leave a legacy that people know that I wanted to, one, make this place better. And two, that I wanted every athlete that came through the track and field program to know they were loved, to know they were respected, to know that we did everything to help them when they walked off this campus to be successful in life. That's the legacy I want to leave here. I don't want anybody to ever feel like they came here and got shorted. And I got one more for you. Oh, okay. Um, track and field can be grueling. You know, I see you leave early nights, come back late days. Um, I've noticed that you picked up bowling as a little bit of a hobby to get away from that. Talk about how that's helped you kind of step away and go into a different, a different Mike Holloway. Well, I think the biggest thing is, you know, more, more than most, I'm a very competitive guy. And, and bowling has allowed me to be at, you know, 63 years old, I can compete at something. And it's very challenging at times. It's very frustrating at times, but it allows me to have that outlet where I can go and compete and, and you know, just not talk about track. The, the wonderful thing here is that there's a lot of great bowlers in the community and they've accepted me as a bowler, you know, that I think the first six months or so, a lot of people didn't even know who I was until we were bowling one night and the NCAA indoor meet came on and they're like, hey, I know that guy, you know. <laughs> but um, bowling allows me to, to, as you know, it's a safe place for me. I can go there, I can go by myself and, you know, bowl for an hour and a half, two hours and clear my mind. Or sometimes I go with friends, sometimes I go with you. And um, then I, I bowl in a couple of leagues uh, during the fall, you know, from the fall into the uh, early spring. So bowling's been great for me. It really has. And it's easy on my Achilles. <laughs> Thank you for your insight, Coach. I think that the viewers should know that I already knew was that no matter how many championships you win and how great of a coach that I know that you are, that you're one of the most humble people on this planet. And thank you. Appreciate I appreciate you for taking your time today. And thank you to our viewers for joining us. Until next time, good night.